Greetings, folks. The message you're about to listen to as you download the sermon does have a few glitches in the first five minutes. We had internet challenges and the recording was affected because of that. So we ask that you just bear with us and uh, the rest of the sermon content will be clear. Grace and peace to you. Right. Folks, this morning... The message that we are going to share with you, I want to uh, up front just uh, make a disclaimer and say the title I have chosen came as a result of obviously what I want to share with you, but it is it is something I was listening to a podcast and this gentleman used some similar wording and I thought, wow, that is a really good way of, of putting it. So the title of my message this morning is, my disclaimer is, I not entirely my, my own title, whether he got it from someone or not, but dearly bought free. Dearly, as in dearly bought given. So turn with me to the book of Luke, Luke chapter 1. I see there is a mystery in chapter 12, uh, Luke 24, I beg your pardon, verse 1. So Luke 24, verse 1. And can you put down? Well, Luke 24. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulchre, bringing spices which they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulchre. And they entered in and found not the body. And he came to the house of the much protected, and told Two men stood by them in shining armor. As they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, I see the living. It's not now. Remember how he spake to them, saying, The Son of Man must be man and be there he cried. They remember. Turned from the sepulchre and to all the rest. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Mary, the mother of James, and the other woman that was with him, which told us things unto the apostles. And their words seemed to them as idle fact, and they believed them not. Then arose Peter and ran unto the sepulchre, and stooping down, he beheld. Lying by the souls, wandering in himself at the back. But this morning, may it effectually work with me. Lord, may we take your word seriously and take it for its place of value and what it teaches us. I am in person live. Folks, scripture declares here in Luke 24, now on the first day of the week, gather on Sunday. Um, we talk about weekend. In essence, Sunday is the first day of the week. So we start our week off as we gather today. So today is the first day of the week. I don't, you know, a lot of people go, oh, one, first day of the week. No, just get your mind right. Sunday is the first day of the week. It starts off with a rest, right? So, and so the scriptures declare now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning. So it is bringing spices which they had prepared and some others with them. And they found the stone all the way from the sepulchre. So when now let me just say the stone was rolled away. Not because Jesus was out. God was going to say, those came to see Christ had left. Christ left too before the stone was rolled away. We need to understand, the purpose of the resurrection is that 
resurrection morning. And he, he left the tomb. He could walk the walls. And he proved that they were waiting. Everything in scripture was there. Ages. It's very specific. And we need to pay careful attention. We need to give attention to what saith the scripture, not what saith the church doctrine, what saith the pastor, what saith the minister, what saith the professor. It's what saith the scripture and allow the scripture to teach you. Scripture will confirm scripture. So as we look at this, we need to, that's the first thing we need to know and understand. The stone was rolled away, not so that Christ could get out, but so that when they came to the tomb, they could see he was not there. Verse three, and they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. You know who these two men were? Angels. Folks, angels are men, not women. Now, I know that, you, you know, tradition teaches us angels are women. Angels are men. And when you see women as, as angelic beings, it's... Normally not good. <laughs> Just let the scripture teach you. And they were afraid. Well, I don't know about you, but if I got to the tomb and, uh, and there were these two folks in, in, in shining garment and, and you knew that, you know, you, well, I, I, I think I'm going to be a little afraid, not so. And bowed down their faces to the earth and they said unto them, why seek ye the living among the dead. Can you imagine getting a question like that? Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Then they're going to tell them something. Remember how he spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee. Folks, we need to look, and there's not time to go through all these scriptures, but when the Lord Jesus Christ was walking on the face of this earth and his 12 apostles with him and the disciples around him and he was going around and he was teaching and he was sharing stuff, their expectation was he was going to establish a literal, visible, physical kingdom in Jerusalem. We looked at last week the reasons, and I'm not going to rehash that. You, you need to look, look at that message when I'm in Message I entitled, The Humble Entry of Christ. You know, we talk about the triumphant entry or Palm Sunday, whatever. I called it the humble entry because it was anything but triumphant. Can you, I mean, you just picture him coming in on a donkey. Not only on a donkey, but the foal. It was anything but regal. And yet he came to accomplish something magnificent. And so the expectation from the apostles, the disciples, those around him was that, you know, Jesus is going to establish this kingdom. Then at the end of his ministry, as he's preparing, he goes and he tells his disciples and the apostles, this is what's going to happen. And this is what what Luke is referring to here. Don't you remember he told you these things? Even Peter rebukes the Lord when Jesus says, I must go and I must be sacrificed. Peter says, not so, Lord. And Jesus actually turns to him and says, get the behind me, Satan. Not because he's, Peter was Satan, but because what was coming out of Peter's mouth was not of God. The thinking, we need to understand, take yourself back. We need to understand that these apostles were not expecting. They did not believe Jesus is going to come and die and pay for my sin. And hallelujah, I'm going to be saved by his grace. They did not believe that. They did not know that. So now the Holy Spirit through Luke here is, is, is recording and writing down and these, these, these events are taking place and we need to understand there's some progressive revelation that is taking place. We have the benefit of looking back and having all of Scripture now and looking back to see what has unfolded. But what we need to know is we need to know that there are some things that those folks down there, and I was just about to walk and I'm going to go out of a shot of the camera, but I can't. But down there didn't know what you and I know today. So we've got to be very careful that we don't take what we know today and apply it to what was happening then. You, you understand what I'm saying? We today know how we are saved and we're going to look at that. But so we need to grasp and understand the things that are, that are happening there.
And he comes and says, the son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. And they didn't know what he was talking about. No, what does the scripture say? And they remembered his words. Ah, okay. <laughs> uh, ladies, you, you know, we, we, when, you, when you speak to us men and you tell us something and then we're listening, but we don't fully hear. <laughs> and then afterwards you say, but I told you. Really? <laughs> Gentlemen, I think the same. It happens, right? When, when you're telling someone something and you think they're listening to you. And then when the... Uh, yes, okay. This is what's happening here. I mean, their mindset was not listening. Jesus, you're going to go die. This is what's going to happen. You're going to pay for my sins. Then you're going to, you're going to rise again. And you're going to bring in the, the age of grace. None of that. These folks, can you imagine how they felt? Peter denied the Lord. You know, first, Lord, I'm going to die with you. And then when Jesus is arrested, what happens? I don't know this man. His speech, his accent and his speech gave him away. It's like if we were to go, you know, you know when a Durbanite comes to visit you, right? You just know that accent. My cousin's from Durban. When they come down, you just like, that's a Durbanite. We know that, you know. Now we, we, are, we, are, we are just mixed up. We're not sure whether we come from Port Elizabeth or Tobacco or Carija or whatever. Anyway. And returned from the sepulchre and told all these things unto the eleven and to all the rest. Why were there eleven? Because Judas had hung himself. And Matthias had not yet been appointed. I mean, I, I know that's a small detail, but it's an important detail. We need to, folks, you've got to trust the scripture. And as you read it and as you trust it, it will teach you things that's happening. So right then, there's the eleven. It was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James and other women that were with them, which told these things unto the apostles. And they believed everything that they said. Be no, and their words seemed to them as idle tales. And they believed them not. I mean, can you imagine these women come and say, you're not going to believe it. Then arose Peter and ran unto the sepulchre. It's like, uh, let me just go and double check this. <laughs> let me, what do they have now? Verify live or verify check. <laughs> check. Check the information. Fake news. Peter, I'm going to go and check this. And stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes lying by themselves. And he departed wandering in himself in that which was to come to pass. So, Go with me to the book of Psalms now. Psalm, Psalm 22. Here is a psalm written by David, and David is expressing his, his innermost thoughts. He's expressing historical fact, but he's also writing down prophetic words. Psalm 22. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's David writing, thinking, you know, what's happened? But ring a bell? The words that Christ uttered on the cross. Think about that. We sing that song, when, when he was on the cross, I was on his mind. You know, I, I'm, I'm thinking about myself. Here's Christ hanging on the cross. He has been mutilated beyond recognition. Please, folks, understand. He didn't just get a little whipping and a, a little slap here and there. They beat him. The, his, his body was battered, bruised. Beyond recognition, I, I really firmly believe that. They had plucked out and pulled out his beard. Anybody here with a gentleman here with long beards? <laughs> Can you imagine that? Having your beard pulled out and plucked out? Goodness gracious, man. 
just pull out one of these little thing, eyebrows of mine out, and, and, and his face would have been swollen. Can you imagine? And the anguish and the, and, the, and the emotional torment and the spiritual torment that he suffered on that cross. And yet he could remember scripture. And he uttered the words from scripture. Verse 2, O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not, and in the night, night season, am, and am not silent. Let's just drop down. Further, um, verse 9, but thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me, me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from all my mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me. Think about Christ hanging on the cross. There he is hanging, and he's got, he's got all these people around. Being, he's been scoffed at. He's been laughed at. He's been tormented. But folks, around him is the spiritual realm, the devils that are around him at that time. Because when Christ came to earth, what was Satan's modus operandi? Was to, was to occupy the land. Why? Because Satan also thought, okay, this man's going to come and set up a little visible physical kingdom. What am I going to do? I'm going to occupy the land. Remember when Christ cast the devils out of the, the man in the mountains, the, the devil said to him, cast us not out of the land, let us go unto the swine. Remember? Why? Well, because they wanted to stay in the land. That was the instruction from Satan. And they're going to the swine, what do the swine do? Pigs all run into the sea. I often think about that. I mean, what were pigs doing in Israel? Well, they didn't eat them. So what were they doing? Selling them to Gentiles. Making money. The Lord's like, and off the pigs go. Where did those devils go? I, I, I don't say demons because in the de demonic realm, some demons are portrayed as good. But if you use the word devil, it's de evil. Cannot only, it can only be evil. The devils, and that's why the King James Bible uses the word devils and not demons. The devils. Where do you think they went? Well, they're in the spiritual realm, right? So when Christ is hanging on the cross, he's utterly alone. He's physically tormented, battered, beaten beyond recognition, emotionally drained, spiritually alone. For three hours he hung God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, separated themselves from Christ. But not only was he alone, folks, can you imagine the spiritual torment around him and him being, and he was fully aware of the spiritual realm and the bulls of Bashan. I mean, the, the most fiercest and ferocious of devils around him, tormenting him. You get the picture? Oh, we want to just talk about the beautiful resurrection of our Lord, and it's, it's important. But we need to understand Dearly bought. Dearly bought. To give it to us freely today. And yeah, this, this, David's writing. Look, look what they look. Uh, uh, verse 15. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue cleaveth to my jaws. And thou hast brought me unto the dust of death. What did Jesus say? I thirst. For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones they look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. But be not thou far from me, O Lord. O my strength, haste thee to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling, from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth. Who's that? Satan. Satan's known by a number of names. A serpent. The lion's mouth. The dragon. Thou hast heard me from the horns of the unicorns. The unicorns are wild bulls. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. So think about all that, you know, we, we need to understand the magnitude of what took place when, he, when Christ was crucified and in that period of time that he, was, that he was in hell. Now, I'll explain that now. He was not in the torment side of hell because at the time when Christ died, 
paradise where the saints went, Abraham and David and all of that, was in the heart of the earth, and hell, the torment side, was also in the heart of the earth. You had two compartments. That's why you get the story with the rich man and Lazarus that goes in, and, and, and Lazarus, the poor man, I'm talk, not talking about Lazarus, that Jesus raised from the dead, another Lazarus, the one that, the poor man that sat outside the rich man's gate where the, the Bible says the dogs came and licked his sores. <laughs> Can you imagine what his physical body must have been like? But the Bible says when he died, where did he go? To paradise. And the rich man dies and he goes to the torment side of hell. And there in the heart of the earth, there is communication. You know that your soul can communicate. The real essence of who you are is your soul. And there it is. And so what happens is, why, why was Abraham and all the saints and and David and Samuel and all of them in paradise in the heart of the earth. Why not in heaven? Well, because they had to wait for the Lord Jesus Christ to pay the ultimate sacrifice. And to present himself on that resurrection morning to God, his father, as the final sacrificial lamb. The Bible doesn't indicate when, but the moment Christ did that on the on the resurrection morning, that when Christ... Be, he ascended into to heaven, presented himself as the spotless lamb, came back. Can you imagine traveling at that? I mean, we cannot, we cannot see heaven. He enters in, he presents himself as a spotless lamb, he comes back down. And I believe from that time, somewhere on there, it was impossible because Paul gives indication, paradise is now in the third heaven. So those, those saints, those believers could now enter the third heaven because their, their sins were covered. But once Christ had died and he paid for the sin, he died, he was buried. And once he'd risen as that sacrificial lamb and presented himself to God the Father as the final sacrifice, now all those saints could enter the glory and the splendor of heaven. And that's why today the word of God tells us to be absent from the body is to be what? Present with the Lord, because Paul tells us paradise is now in the third heaven. So we don't have to go to any place of waiting. We go straight into the presence of the Lord. Your soul and your spirit, as you leave this broken world as a believer, folks, enters heaven. Think about that for a moment. Dearly bought, freely given. So let me just, there's a lot being said about you know, this time of year, you, you, you read all these things and there's different things about the folded napkin. And I see all the stories written about the folded napkin and what it means and Jewish culture and all of that. You know, I think sometimes that we overcomplicate things. Here's my understanding of this. You're free to forget, um, not believe or trust or believe something else. But here's my understanding of it. Go with me to John chapter 20. John chapter 20, verse 1. Now, before, before this is before the cross, Jesus comes and uh, he's going to raise Lazarus. But l just notice in John chapter 20, the, the record of the folded napkin first, and then we're going to go to John 11. John 20. The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark, right? So the sun had risen unto the sepulcher. And so John gives you further information that it, the, the sun hadn't risen. It was still dark. And seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. Then she runneth and cometh unto Simon Peter to the other disciples whom Jesus loved and said unto them, they have taken away the Lord out of the sepulcher and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth and the other disciple and came to the sepulcher. So they ran both together and the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. John, I believe, is writing. He's, he's talking about the other disciple. He's referring to himself in the third person. here. He's not saying, and I outran Peter. He's, John is writing this, <laughs> but John outran Peter. But notice what happens. The, the account in Luke says, who went in? Peter. But listen what happens. So they ran both together and the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. And he stooping down and looked in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. So John gets there first and he goes, but the Bible says in Luke, who went into the tomb? Peter. 
So it's just clarification of, of information. Then came Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulchre and seeing the linen clothes lie and the napkin that was about his head not lying with the linen clothes but wrapped together in a place by itself. Okay. Let's go now to John 11. All right. If you came here this morning and you wanted to just hear a nice, easy message, that, that's it. This is Bible study, folks. Let's get into the Word here. John 11, what better day to do it than, than today and every day, but John 11, verse 43. So, and I'm just for time's sake going to just take from verse 43 here and not read the whole thing. Now, we know Jesus can't, he's called, Lazarus is sick. We know the story, and Jesus gets there, Lazarus has died. And verse 43, and when he thus spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound, now take note, bound hand and foot with the grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. So Lazarus, when he came forth, he came, uh, I, I'm just trying to picture it, all right? He's bound. He says, Lazarus, come forth. How do you think he came forth? He's bound. His face is bound with a napkin. So what does Lazarus need? Help. To be unbound. Why? Because Lazarus did not have a resurrected body as the Lord Jesus Christ. He had been brought back to life, but he'd been brought back to life in his same body that was still going to die again. And so the scripture here just tells us that the napkin was about, so they had to go and unwind and help him. So when Jesus rises, the napkin is set aside. What does that tell you? He needed no help. Because his resurrected body could go straight through. The, the napkin could have laid there, but it was removed. Why? Because Christ had the power to take up his body. Now for me, that's the simple explanation. We don't have to get into all the... You're free to believe what else is out there, folks. But for me, it's proof of life. In December, we got a call. My son, as m most of you know, lives in Cape Town. And uh, we got a call, you know, when you get that call and say, hi, I'm just phoning to get Wayne's medical aid number. You know something's wrong, right? <laughs> it's like, what? I don't know this number. <laughs> anyway, he had, he had, he, he, he's a dog trainer and he there was, there was a dog that had got loose and attacked another dog and he of course went in to save the whole situation and got bitten and his hands were not looking too good but so they took him off to hospital and there he was and uh, so we're trying to get hold of everybody so it's like what's happening you know you, you're waiting anxiously then we got this photo with Wayne lying there on the bed with his hands soaking in I assume disinfectant, and the lady that sent it to us says, proof of life. <laughs> okay, proof of life. When I, when I think of that, and I think of this folded napkin, proof of life. His own, he, it, it, to me, it is proof that Christ did. He did not need any angel to come in to unwrap him. He did not need the stone to be rolled away for someone to come and unwrap him. And to, he did it himself. So that unwrapped now, there it is, proof of life. Enough said, all right? Let's move on. And they found the stone rolled away in verse 2, and they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. So go with me to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 9. Now, the book of Hebrews is a book written specifically to, what's the name of the book? Hebrews, to the Jews, to give them some further instruction as to what was going to happen after the resurrection and on this period of time that, that they were going to have to go through, which is a period of tribulation, and they were going to need to have some instruction. And uh, they haven't gone through that period of time yet. We, we believe that we, the church, the body of Christ, every single one of us here makes up the church, the body of Christ, um, will 
If we are alive at the time and haven't left this broken world where our physical bodies have ceased to function, we'll be taken in what is known as the catching away of the church, the body of Christ, the rapture. And after that period of time, the nation of Israel, God will once again begin to use them and work through them. And, and they are going to need some instruction. But we can look at the book of Hebrews and we can learn from here and understand certain things. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 24 For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the, the true, but unto the heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. So, so what the writer of Hebrews is saying is Christ didn't have to go in like the, the priest would have to go into the Holy of Holies once a year and make sacrifice and atonement, first of all for himself and then for the nation of Israel, but every year have to go in and, and the, the, the blood sacrifices to atone and to cover the sins waiting for the coming Messiah, the final sacrificial lamb. So it, Christ went in once. Christ presented himself to God the Father once as that sacrificial lamb. That's it. He doesn't have to come back down and die again on the cross and come back down and he's done it. Now yet that he would suffer himself often as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with the blood of others. That's the blood of bulls and goats and stuff. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world, but now once in the end of the world, he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. As And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. So Christ was offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So folks, the scriptures te tell us and teach us, you know, Christ made that sacrifice once. Now, we remember that. And we should do that every single day. Now, I know that, you know, today's we, we talk about Easter weekend and we talk about this. But today, and I'm sorry if I'm going to upset somebody here now, but today is no more holy than any other day. It's not the day. We've set aside today, we come, we've gathered, we're talking about this, but it's not the day that is holy, folks. It's not the day. It's the event that took place. And it's the one who lives within you. The Lord Jesus Christ, through God the Holy Ghost, lives within you. Every single day, every single moment of every single day. That means he sees what you do, knows what you think. Did you know that? <laughs> he knows every thought. People often say to me, should I, should I pray about this? And I say, well, have you thought about it? Yes. Well, who lives within you? The Holy Spirit. Well, if you thought about it, who knows about it? <laughs> you need to be conscious that you are in communication with God 24-7, 365 and, and a quarter and... Every single moment of every single day. There is never a moment that you... Now, you may feel alone. You may feel forsaken. You, when, when Jesus Christ said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was alone. God the Father and God the Holy Spirit had separated themselves from him so he could be made the sacrificial lamb, so he could take upon himself our sin. He, he, was, he was not sinful. He did not pay for his sin. He paid for our sin. That is the only period of time, three hours in all of human history, all of creation, past and future, that Christ was alone. And he suffered that. For you and I, the absolute torment, being alone, being tormented by the devils, by the spiritual realm around us. You and I today as believers are never alone. And we must not base our Christian walk based on feelings because you are going to feel alone. You are going to feel God has forsaken you. But that is not the truth. God's word tells us in the book of Romans, Paul the Apostle writes, in Romans chapter 8, that nothing can separate you from the love of God, neither life nor death. And that is our hope. 
And that is why we can say it was dearly bought, but freely given. Today, you and I, we live in this period of time for the last 2,000 years. We have now been living in this period of time known as the dispensation or the age, the dis word dispensation. It's a word that Paul uses. It's a, to dispense a period of time. And he's dispensing grace, mercy, and peace. God is dispensing grace, mercy, and and peace so when you have pain when you have suffering when you have illness when you have death it is not coming from god it is coming from the brokenness of this world but within the brokenness of this world you and i now can live our lives in the strength of the knowledge of knowing God is with us. And we have to constantly remind ourselves of that. And the way we do that is to read the word of God. And that's why when we gather like this on a Sunday, when we gather on Wednesdays, when you sit in your own home and you're reading the word, you are reinforcing the love of God in your mind. And you control your Christian walk through knowledge. The knowledge of God's word working in and through you. And that helps you to cope. And that helps you to manage. The problem is you live in a physical body that is wired for sin and wired to think completely differently. Paul the Apostle writes, it's a wretched man that I am. Who shall deliver me from this body of sin? Why? Because he knows and he understands. So every one of us here grapple with things that, that, that we, things we don't want to do that we do. Things that we should do that we don't do. We all grapple with that. And we, we need to understand that. Christ overcame that for us. Just go with me to the book of Matthew quickly. Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, verse 39. These people, um, verse 38, let's go from, then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answering, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. Show us a sign. We want to see. He answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall be no sign be given unto it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. Now, these are who? Pharisees and scribes, knowing the Old Testament. And he says, the sign of Jonah. They would have known the story of Jonah. What happened with Jonah? Right? He was given instruction by God to go to a Gentile city, Nineveh, and go and tell them about the wrath of God to come. Jonah, he didn't want to go because he wanted that city to face God's wrath. Can you imagine that? Go and tell them, my wrath is coming. Huh? Go tell them, my wrath is coming. Huh, Lord? I want you to, yeah? Deal with them. So what happens? Jonah takes a detour. We know what happens. He's on the ship. And they get into this Massive storm. Eventually, what do they do? Over you go, Jonah. And uh, he is eaten by the whale. Swallowed. And a lot of folks said, well, how can a man live for three days? Jonah didn't live. He died. Because Jesus says, as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man, ten minutes, thank you, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights the heart of the earth, in hell. So what happens? The well eats Jonah. <laughs> Probably it's a bit of indigestion, or I don't know how the Lord calls it. The well comes up, beaches itself. Boop, out comes Jonah. What happens? God resurrects him. No problem. He's God. 
You know, we, we, we go through all these, oh, but you know, scientifically not. He died. Jonah died, folks. If you read the story and you read it carefully, he died. The whale spews him out. God resurrects him. What does Jonah do? Okay, Lord, I'm going. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the, the whale's belly, so Jesus, Jesus died. He died, folks. He wasn't swooning his death. He wasn't lying in a coma. He died. Very specific. He was pierced. Pericardial sac around his heart. He was pierced. He died. He fulfilled scripture. Sure, there's so much I want to share with you, but let's just bring this to a close. The reality Christ paid for your sin on the cross at Calvary. It was dearly bought. And today, now, you and I can see through the writings of the Apostle Paul that what Christ did for us and what he accomplished is now not just offered as Christ was offering that salvation to the Jews because it was at his time he was offering that salvation. Once he had risen, he offered another year for the Jewish nation to accept him as their Messiah. And if that had been the case and that they had accepted him, he would have set up his kingdom, literal, visible, physical kingdom on the earth. They rejected him. That did not happen. So God raised up the apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus, a Jew, who, by the way, was as religious and as knowledgeable of the, of the, of the Old Testament as you could get. But he was also a lost man because he had committed the unpardonable sin by standing and allowing to reject the Holy Spirit because through um, Stephen, the Holy Spirit is speaking. And in Acts chapter 7, they stone Stephen and they kill Stephen. The Holy Spirit was speaking through him. So now all the, they lost. Now they're going to a lost eternity. So how is God now going to save the nation of Israel? Because he needed, the nation of Israel needed to be saved so that they could go out and win the Gentile world. So now what? But God knew what he was doing. And he raised up the apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus. And he gives him this new revelation to say, I'm no longer going to work exclusively through the, the Jewish nation. I'm now going to offer this salvation that was dearly bought by my, by my son. I'm now going to offer it to anyone who believes. And we get that instruction, that information through the Apostle Paul, the 13 books that he writes. And we, we, we know and understand that he, he brings this message. And in 2 Timothy chapter 2, we've been looking at these verses Prior to uh, this Easter weekend, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 7 to 10, I'll just read it for you. Paul says, consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Remember that Jesus, Christ of the seed of David, was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Paul is saying, listen, there is some further revelation which I'm now going to give you, which Peter and the eleven did not give you once Matthias was brought in as the eleventh apostle. They were still going out and teaching the nation of Israel. Paul says, hang on, this message that I'm now bringing is this message that is offered to all. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9. Here's the message for us as Christians today. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Wherefore, remember that ye being in time past Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision. The Jews looked upon the Gentiles with disdain. That at that time, Gentiles, you were without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. The only way you could get accepted by God is to proselyte over to become a Jew or to do something good for a Jew. Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, 
verse 13. But now, in Christ Jesus, ye who were sometimes far off, who's that, Gentiles, are made near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, Jews and Gentiles, one. And it's broken down the middle wall of partition. No longer Jew or Gentile. Now, all one in Christ. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of two, that's Jew and Gentile, one new man, one body of Christ, to make in peace. Folks, whether you're a Jew or Gentile today, the only way you get saved is to believe and trust that Jesus Christ paid for your sin on the cross, that he died, was buried, and he rose again. That is the gospel according to Paul. The good news that Paul brings us. That good news. Ephesians 5, 14. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that thou work, walk circumspectly. That word circumspectly means carefully. Not as fools, but as wise. Redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Boy, oh boy, are the days evil. Hello, are the days evil? Is this world full of issues? <laughs> Doesn't matter where you go in the world, right? Is any government, anyone can tell me which government we can trust fully here? Yeah? All right? No. Why? Because it's made up of people. And mankind, Paul the Apostle warns, as the, this age of grace draws to a close, men shall be lovers of their own souls, greedy, proud, high-minded. Let me read it to you. Second Timothy chapter 3. I'm going to end with this. This know also that in the last days. Which last days? The last days of grace. The last days that God is offering grace, mercy, and peace. The last days, perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Do we see that? Covetous. Boasters. Proud. Blasphemers. Disobedient to parents. Unholy, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, no care. See an accident happening. First thing you do, hop out the car, whip out your cell phone, take a video so you can post it on TikTok and who's going to help? False accusers, incontinent, that incontinent means without self-control, not body movement. <laughs> Fierce, despisers of those that are good. Do we live in a world today where right is wrong and wrong is right? Yes. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such, turn away. Folks, we live in a world that is like that today. Now, I don't know how long this, the Lord is going to tarry. I don't know. But I do know this. That you and I have a responsibility to take God's word and to take it seriously and to live by it and to read it and trust it every single day. And as long as the Lord tarries and as long as we living in this world, we need to take God's word and allow it to effectually work in us. And let us not be part of the brokenness of the world out there. And let us not do, we were chatting, Eugene and I were chatting after, the things are happening in governments because everyone is just saying, oh, well, they're doing it, so I may as well go and do it. You do what is right. You do what God's word declares. Because guess what, folks? Not only are you showing the world out there, but the angelic realm is learning from you, the word of God says. Even when you're alone, sitting, reading your word, the word, doing something on your own, you think, no one can see what I'm doing. You honor God. You know why? Because the spiritual realm sees. The angels see the good and the bad. The fallen. One third of the angelic realm has fallen. They see and they learn. How can such a fallen creation and being do what he or she does? Because we have God's word working within us. Let that be our hope. Christ the Lord is risen. And he wants to live his life in and through you. 
through the Holy Spirit that lives within you. And as you take his word and allow the word to work, the life of Christ will be manifest. You are like you are like a. A canvas for the life of Christ, that as his life impacts you and as his word impacts you, you shine forth his light. Let that be your hope as we go out through this week. Thank you for listening so well, and uh, may you be blessed and encouraged. And for those of you spending time with family and have family down for this long weekend, um, tomorrow you can wake up and say, it's Monday, but it's holiday, if it is holiday for you. <laughs> All right. Father God, we give you thanks. We give you praise for the goodness of your grace and your mercy. And as we have gathered today, may we once again just be reminded of the wonderful truth of your word. And thank you for what your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, accomplished for us. Lord, we know that it is not through our effort. We have no reason to boast other than boasting of the cross. And the fact that you have given us the free gift of salvation that we by faith believe and trust and receive. And as we believe it, as we trust it, as we receive it, we pray, dear Lord, that we will take your word and read it and allow it to work within us and be the ambassadors you wish us to be. We thank you for this in and through Christ Jesus. Amen.